ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. There are times you'll spend months preparing for that special day, like when your child is born or when you get hitched to the love of your life. You get so invested that you might start to lose perspective and your special day becomes unforgettable for all the wrong reasons. Births, deaths and marriages. A new miniseries by Background Briefing. Available now on ABC Listen. When artificial intelligence tools like ChatGPT first landed, students rejoiced. Who wouldn't want a computer doing your homework or assessments? That's why universities and schools across the country banned its use. But now, Sydney University is leading the way to overturn that ban, which it says doesn't work. Today, we chat with academic Danny Liu, who came up with a new way for students to be tested to get around the AI problem. I'm Sam Hawley on Gadigal Land in Sydney. This is ABC News Daily. Okay, Danny, given you're a professor of educational technologies, the explosion of generative AI over the last couple of years must have kept you extremely busy. Just tell me how big this shift has been in the education sector. So it's been really interesting to see how the education sector has responded to this initially Mm. with a bit of moral, a lot of moral panic around what do we do about assessments and the validity of our degrees these days. But it's interesting to kind of see that in the past six months, the conversation has kind of shifted towards, you know, what are we even doing here as a higher education sector? What value should we be bringing to the community, to our students? So just over a couple of years, the education sector changed remarkably since ChatGPT was launched towards the end of 2022. Back then, of course, a lot of unis, including Sydney University, moved to ban the technology. Just remind me, what was the thinking at the time back then? So I think it's a very natural reaction when you're confronted with a technology which can do a lot of the things that you thought was once uh, only in the realm of human output. So the reaction of banning was very natural and very understandable. Uh, But what we quickly realized at Sydney Uni um, in in the first week or two of this was that you couldn't actually keep banning this. Uh, And so we worked towards a stage where we had to Uh, think about how to properly integrate AI into learning and teaching assessment um, and also how to secure and assure that students had learnt. Hmm. Just a reminder, because chat GPT, how does it work? You can just put your essay question in, can you, and press enter and uh, there you go, there's your essay. One of the ways that universities have secured written assessments up until the, the advent of or the release of chat GPT was using plagiarism detection software and plagiarism detection software relies upon finding text which is very similar to previously submitted or existing text. Mm-hmm. One of the big issues with ChatGPT and these generative AIs is that they are generative, which means that when you put in a prompt like a set of assignment instructions, what can come out the other end every single time you hit chat is completely different. Mm. And so at that stage, universities were thinking, "Uh uh-oh, we have no longer any way to detect if this writing is actually coming from a a student or coming from not the student that we think it's coming from. Uh, And because there is no similarity between the AI's outputs um, every time you hit enter. So lecturers, what they could not tell if AI was actually being used by that student. It's impossible. Yes. So uh, a lot of research has come out over the past two years um, looking at these AI detectors. Uh, Basically, you're using AI to detect the presence of AI writing Uh, and all the research coming out is basically saying it's very inaccurate, you can't rely on it and also it's very easy to fool these AI detectors as well. If you just get AI to write in a particular way, you can actually make text undetectable by these detectors. Mm, So the ban is then sort of useless, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's one thing to say, you know, you can't use it um, but we can't actually 
know if students are using it or not. There's no way to detect this. And therefore, we need to take another route, which is actually to think about how we can productively and responsibly integrate this into learning, as well as be able to uh, make sure students have learned what they need to learn. And that, of course, is what Sydney University is now doing, reversing that ban and coming up with new ways of testing students. You're actually leading the team that researched the policy and recommended the ban be scrapped. What did you find in that work when you were looking into it? So the main considerations on our minds were um, two things. Uh, We wanted to make sure that our students could graduate with a really strong and deep appreciation of the risks as well as the opportunities of AI. And as part of that, um, we wanted to have assignments and learning and teaching activities which could actually help students to engage properly with AI. At the same time, we also recognised that we had a requirement to the legislation and also responsibility to the community to make sure that we were graduating students who knew what they were meant to know. And so we had to balance both. Yes, okay, yes, because rather important in some professions that you actually learn and don't rely on AI to tell you everything. Yes, exactly. I think in every everything that we have at university, regardless of which profession or which discipline, we, yeah. we want to be graduating students who actually know or have the necessary disciplinary knowledge and skills and, uh, and values. Okay, so just break that down for me then. How will you now approach AI at Sydney University? And does it depend on the sort of course or the sort of assessment? How will it work? Mm. So we've been developing this approach, which we call the two-lane approach, Mm -hmm. um, for about a year and a half now, actually, and trying to share this with the university community and wider um, and trying to help people to come to terms with this necessary change. And so the way that we're approaching this through the two-lane approach is basically saying to Um, academics and saying to students and the community, we're going to need to have two types of assessments, assessments in one of two lanes. The second lane, which we're calling lane two, open assessments. This is where we're going to have assessments where we will support and scaffold students' use of AI so that they can learn how to use AI, but more importantly, to learn how to gain the disciplinary knowledge and skills and dispositions that they need to gain uh, with the support of AI in many cases, because there is no way to ban it, restrict it, or or block or detect it. Mm. So what do, what just just tell me a bit more about that, though. How do you do that? Well, you, you teach them how to use AI, but how are they then actually learning? Yes. So we would show them, I guess, in class, one of the examples is we would show them in class um, a different AI tools, which may be appropriate for a particular assignment that they have. Uh, and then we'll explain to them, you know, for this particular assignment, maybe it's a marketing assignment. Uh, maybe you can use Copilot to do some market research. Maybe you can use um, another tool to generate some really um, you know, dazzling images for your your brand identity. Uh, and while you're doing this, what we're helping students to do is recognize that the AI tools are out there, that they can be used effectively, mm. um, and explaining to them how they can use them without replacing their learning. Okay. Okay. Now that's lane two. Yes. That's using AI. So tell me about lane one, what happens there? So the problem with lane two by itself is that we may end up with a situation where we're going to have students using AI completely for everything and not doing any learning. And so we still need to check that students have learned. And that's where the lane one kicks in. And lane one assessments are assessments which are secured and in person. So essentially they're supervised and they're an opportunity for us as educators to confirm that students have actually learned. Now, often people see lane one as, oh, we're just going to bring back the exam hall, or we're going to sit students down for, you know, 20 hours of exams every every semester. But that's not the case. There's a lot of different, quite authentic ways to run lane one secure assessments uh, face-to-face, which does not involve sitting down in exam hall. Right. So what, what other options are there? So one option that we're experimenting with here um, this year and also uh, in the next two years uh, are called interactive oral assessments. Now, interactive oral assessments sounds like an oral exam or a viva voce, uh, but it's a little bit more um, interactive uh, Mm. than that and it's a bit more authentic. And so an interactive oral assessment could be something like what we're doing now, which is a podcast. And so if you imagine I'm the student and you're my teacher and we've been given this scenario of a podcast and say I'm a marketing student and, and you are, um, you're a host interviewing me about, um, about marketing approaches you know, in the contemporary society. 
So you could be asking me really interesting questions like, you know, how do you understand your 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 client, your customers? How do you understand your market? How would you um, you know, structure a particular marketing campaign and those kind of things? And as a student, I would be there as the kind of the podcast guest, so to speak, um, answering your questions live, using the knowledge I have gained through the Lane 2 assessments mm -hmm. uh, and through the learning and teaching activities you, you've given me over the semester. And essentially, you'll be able to, through this kind of live conversation, guide me through a really nice kind of narrative of uh, helping me to unpack and synthesize what, I'm, what, what I know, mm. and at the same time, being able to judge if I have actually um, attained the learning outcomes. Yeah, right. So proving that you have actually learned something, even if part of it is from AI. Indeed. So I guess the point of the two-lane system is to say to students, we don't mind you using AI to learn. Um, we know you're going to use it anyway. And so we're going to be helping you to do it productively and responsibly mm. um, as part of learning, but also as part of these lane two assessments. But we need to make sure, and you need to make sure for yourself that you have actually learned because you'll be sitting these lane one interactive orals, for example, um, where we will be checking your learning. I guess one question that uh, all degree coordinators need to ask themselves is, what do we want students to learn these days? For humanities degrees, it will be things like, you know, deep critical thinking, uh, literacy about global perspectives. Um, it might be information literacy. It might be things like, you know, creativity and ethical reasoning. And all those skills you can develop with students through different lane two assessments. And then when they come to you for maybe an interactive oral, uh, a lane one assessment, you may not want to sit them for an exam for these things, but if you have a conversation with students and assess that conversation, uh, for example, the scenario could be, the examiner is a relative at a barbecue um, and the student is, is you know, their nephew or niece or something. Uh, and then the relative needs to talk the student through what they understand about the humanitarian crisis in the Middle East, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then the relative will say, oh, what do you think about this? You know, but, you know, but, but this person said this. Um, what does this mean in this context? And that questioning, that line of questioning will allow students to really express what they know. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of ethical reasoning, in terms of critical thinking, all those kinds of things. Wow. Okay. It sounds like it's going to be more work <laughs> for students and teachers. Mm. <laughs> that's a that's a really it, it's a really important uh, thought to, to to think through. And I think one of the responses I usually say to this is to think about what we currently do in in higher education in terms of assessment and teaching. And we often overassess. Uh, we, we give students a lot of assignments and those kind of things, which already causes us a lot of workload, mm. marking all these essays and those kind of things, which may not actually be able to tell us anymore truly what a student knows. And so in a way, if we plan these lane one assessments right at a program level between subjects, then it might, may actually, or very likely is going to reduce workload. Ah, oh, okay. Well, they'll all be happy with that then. <laughs> <laughs> But Danny, you know, AI, it's changing the world, it's changing education. And I guess your view is we kind of need to go with it and adapt. One fear that I have um, that kind of keeps me up at night is, you know, imagining five, 10 years into the future, seeing a headline on the ABC, bridge collapse, comma, student used AI to complete assessments at university. Ah, uh, gosh. And that really scares me. The fact of the matter is students are using it. Um, all the research coming out from various groups around Australia and also the world are saying that, you know, eight out of 10 students are admitting to using AI. That probably just means two out of 10 students just aren't admitting it, but they're actually using it anyway. And uh, of the students who are surveyed, a lot of students are saying, well, we use it, but we don't really know how to use it properly. Um, we would love our teachers to show us how to use it well mm -hmm. for our discipline. And so we need to adapt with the students with technology because we know that students are using it. We know that we're using it now and into the future. Uh, and it's, I guess, the role of educators to foster and develop students who have that responsible and productive engagement with technologies available, which includes AI. Danny Liu is a Professor of Education Technologies at the University of Sydney. This episode was produced by Sydney Pete, Takara Jensen-McKinnon. Audio production by Anna John and Sam Dunn. Our supervising producer is David Cody. I'm Sam Hawley. Join me next week as we look back at the year in politics, world news and finance with Laura Tingle, John Lyons and Alan and Chris Kohler. And then, 50 years since Cyclone Tracy devastated Darwin, we hear from people who were there 
and look at the legacy of the disaster. That's next week on ABC News Daily. Thanks for listening.